Acts chapter 1, it's a very familiar passage, um, but I'm just believing the Lord has something special to say to us out of this. Acts chapter 1, we'll begin at verse 8. Let's read together, shall we? The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. I know that Pastor Jay on Wednesday night told you that I was planning to begin a series today titled Designer Clothes, and I was. In fact, I had written about two-thirds of the first message and um, then felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to go in a completely different direction. So I've postponed that series for about six weeks, and uh, instead I want to talk to you about preparing for Pentecost. It won't come as any special revelation for me to stand here and tell you that we live in a time when people are under extreme pressure. There are economic and health and career pressures. There are pressures to conform to a cultural narrative where reason and common sense and even science are abandoned in favor of a subjective relativism based on feelings and personal preferences. Society at large seems to be one giant pressure cooker in which we are sitting on pins and needles wondering when the lid is going to blow. Healthcare professionals are under pressure because of being overworked, trying to care for those who are ill while simultaneously fighting concerns over their own health and safety and well-being. Families are under pressure trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy in a world that is increasingly abnormal. Children in particular are under pressure. Their education has been disrupted. Their sense of security has eroded. Their future has been clouded. Studies have been done that show that many of them are floundering with a sense of hopelessness and aimlessness, trying to regain their footing in a world that has been turned upside down. In many ways, the church and people of faith are under even more pressure as you try to maintain equilibrium in a world that is increasingly secular and antagonistic toward biblical faith and values. Most of these attacks are not new, but the critics seem to have become more emboldened in their assaults against things like the authenticity and the accuracy and the authority of the Bible. Cardinal doctrines of the virgin birth of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus are being dismissed and renounced. Biblical values are being abandoned and in some cases even legislated against. Truth has fallen in the street. Evil is being trumpeted as good and good is being maligned as evil. And the temptation to cave into the pressure of the culture 
is almost unbearable. Can I get a witness from anybody that says what I'm telling you is the truth? Now, the fact that there is this kind of pressure on those who are followers of Jesus should not come as any great surprise. Jesus himself said that he had come to establish a kingdom, but that his kingdom was not of this world. He gave a clue about the nature of the conflict between the people who are citizens of his kingdom and those who are citizens of the kingdom of this world when he said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He said, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He gave a warning about how the conflict would escalate as the end of time was approaching when he said in Luke 21, verses 12 and 13, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and, you will, and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my namesake. And then he said, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. He continued in verses 16 through 19 of that chapter and said, but you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. The apostle Paul wrote to his son in the Lord, young Timothy, about some of the things that would be faced by believers in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He said, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Now, I tell you all this just to remind you, as if you didn't know, that the pressure is on. I said the pressure is on. The question then becomes, how do you withstand the pressure? How do you handle it? How do you keep going? Some people choose to deny it or try to ignore it. The problem with that approach is that the problem continues to intrude and you just can't pretend they don't exist or wish them away. Some people cave in to the pressure. You know, it's just easier to go with the flow. Stop trying to swim upstream. The Lord, however, has given you a way to stand up under the pressure. There is a power available to you that will enable you to not just survive, but to actually thrive under pressure. The setting for the passage that we read at the beginning of the message today takes place about 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Now that Jesus had resurrected from the dead and had been walking with them for the last 40 days, his followers wanted to know in verse 6 if it wasn't time for him to actually establish this kingdom that he'd been telling them about. Jesus responds by saying, no, it's not yet time for the establishment of the full uh, full dimensions of his kingdom on this earth. In fact, he says, this information about when the kingdom is going to be established is beyond your pay grade. <laughs> That's really what he means when he says, it's not for you to know times or epics which the Father has placed in his own hand. That just means it's, it's above your pay grade. There are some things, he says, that need to happen between now and the coming of the kingdom in its fullness. But in the meantime... I'm going to give you the power to live the kingdom life no matter what kind of pressure you face. How does that sound to you? I'll give you the power to do it. It's right there in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So if you want to have power for pressurized living, it begins when you identify the source. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is known as the spirit of power. When Jesus told the disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that didn't sound strange to their ears. 
When they heard those words, they would remember how the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson in Judges chapter 15. And he took the jawbone of a donkey and used it as a weapon to kill a thousand Philistines. They would remember the promise given by the prophet in Ezekiel 36 and 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. They would remember how the word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4 and 6 and said, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. They would remember how Jesus returned from being tempted in the wilderness. The Bible says in Luke 4 and 14 that he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And it was in that power of the Spirit that he began his miracle ministry and the crowds flocked to him. They would remember how Jesus commissioned them to go into the world in John chapter 20. And then before he sent them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in this key verse from the book of Acts, Jesus, by the way, I believe verse 8 is the key verse for the entire book. And here, Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit as the source of power that you are going to need in order to hold up under the pressures of this world. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to face the reality that the source of the power you need is not in your ability to persuade or your charismatic personality. The source of the power you need is not the determination of your will. The source of the power you need is not the advice you get from your counselor. But if you want to know where the power comes from, it's the one Jesus called in John 14 and 16, the helper. The dynamic power you need comes from the Holy Spirit filling your life with his presence. It was the Holy Spirit's anointing that enabled Jesus to perform miracles on this earth. It was the Holy Spirit who transformed the early disciples into a powerful witness that turned the world upside down. It was the Holy Spirit who enabled the early church to endure, endure tribulation and persecution and help them to remain faithful in the midst of it all. And if you're going to stand strong in faith in the midst of opposition and pressure, if you're going to keep going when obstacles are blocking your path, if you're going to fulfill the purpose for which God has placed you on this planet, you're going to need a power beyond yourself. You're going to need supernatural power, the power that only comes from the Holy Spirit. If you're going to have the power you need for living in a pressurized world, you first of all have to identi identify the source. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And once you identify the source of the power, then you need an impartation of the Spirit. It's not enough for you to just recognize the Holy Spirit as the source of the power. There must then come a point where you actually receive this Spirit power and activate it in your life. It doesn't do any good for it to remain on the pages of this book. It doesn't do any good for it to remain a theology or a doctrine of the church. You have to embrace it and receive it and activate it in your life. Amen. Now, now there is a teaching that is quite popular that says that you received the Holy Spirit when you were born again. I want to tell you that statement is both true and false. It's true that you are born again by the Spirit. It's true that you cannot even surrender your life to Jesus without the conviction and the drawing of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's work in salvation is what Romans 8 and 9 is talking about when it says, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you are born again, then it's true that you have the Holy Spirit. But this power dynamic I'm talking about is what we used to call in old church the second blessing. Anybody ever heard that term, the second blessing? It's not a new birth by the Spirit. It's a baptism in the Spirit. This is what you find happening in the establishment of the early church in the book of Acts. 
On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, those 120 people in the upper room, they're already followers of Jesus. You do know that, right? They are fully committed to him. They are born again. But the Holy Spirit blew into their lives in a new dynamic that empowered them to live the transformed life in the face of unbelievable pressure. In Acts chapter 8, Philip, a deacon in the church, went to the city of Samaria and preached the good news of Jesus. A great revival occurred. Everybody from the White House to the Poor House got saved. People were saved. They were healed. They were delivered. Believers were baptized. No question these people are saved. But then Peter sent for Peter and John, or Philip sent for Peter and John. And when these guys arrived, they began laying hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't they already have the Holy Spirit when they were born again? Yes, but there was more. This was a filling of spirit power that gave them an ability to withstand the pressure of a perverse society. This is the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 10. Peter goes to the house of a Gentile convert by the name of Cornelius. And while he's preaching about Jesus, Cornelius and all his household are filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't even have the courtesy to wait to the altar call. The Bible says that they interrupted his message right in the middle of him preaching, and they just got filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the pattern that is then repeated in Acts chapter 19 when the Apostle Paul came to Ephesus. There he met 12 men who had been baptized with the baptism of John, the baptism for repentance. They are believers. But when Paul asked if they have received the Holy Spirit, they answered in verse 2, no, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. In verse 5 then, they are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They're believers, they're saved. Then in verse 6, Paul lays hands on them and and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you, time after time, these early believers stood up to persecution from the religious traditionalists that wanted to deny the resurrection and the di divinity of Jesus. They endured the loss of property, the loss of jobs, the loss of careers, the loss of the ability to support their families. They suffered cruel abuse and torture and even martyrdom from a godless government. And they did it all by the power of of the Spirit. They refused to bend or bow to the pressures of the age, and the way they endured was because they had a second blessing. They weren't just born again, but they were filled with the power of the Spirit. Now, now let, let, uh, let, let me ask you a question. How many of you would go down to the car dealership and purchase a brand new automobile that didn't have an engine in it? This is what your spiritual life is like when you are born again, but not filled with the Spirit. You have a new life. The Bible says it like this in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So what happened is you've traded in your old model. You have a new look. You have a new shine. You even have a new smell. You know, there's, there's nothing like that new car smell, is there? You, you, it's a, but I want to tell you, you're not going to get very far down the road without an engine. And in the same way, you're not going to be able to withstand the pressure of a godless society without the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to live the overcoming life without the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to fulfill your purpose and reach your destiny without the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. You need to be born again and be baptized. But that isn't the end. There is more, so much more. And lest you think this promise of the second blessing of being baptized with the Holy Spirit was limited to the apostles and to the people of the first century church, let me just remind you of Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. He preached in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. He said, for the promise is for you and your children 
and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. I'm telling you, this isn't limited to the first century. This isn't limited to the early apostles. This promise is for you. You know, there are too many who view being baptized with the Spirit as if it were an option. You know, kind of like having Bluetooth or heated seats or a navigation system in your automobile. Hear me today. I'm not trying to be melodramatic and I'm not trying to be negative. But I'm simply being realistic when I tell you that the pressure is only going to intensify. It is. It's going to intensify. And the only way you're going to make it is if you have a greater power on the inside than the pressure coming from the outside. That, that was really good right there, Pastor Adam. I need to say that one again. The only way you can make it is if you've got a greater power on the inside that can resist the pressure coming from the outside. The only way you'll make it is if you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptism isn't an option. He's the engine. He's necessary to get you down the road. He's essential if you're going to hold up and hold on and hold out until the end. Don't try to live in your own strength and ability, but earnestly desire and ask for and seek for and hunger and thirst for the Holy Spirit. Don't be satisfied until you are filled with the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to stand up under the pressure of this age, it will require you to have an impartation of the Spirit. And I just feel like I need to stop long enough right now to say to somebody that has ears to hear, be filled with the Spirit. There's somebody with faith rising in your heart right this very minute. You may be in the house you may be part of the online congregation, but the word of the Lord to you is be filled with the Spirit. You don't have to wait for the end of the message. You don't have to wait for a special invitation song. You don't have to wait for a particular individual to lay hands on you. But right now, with faith rising in your heart, open your mouth in praise. Yield to the presence of God that comes to you in this moment. Receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. I think all over this house, we ought to just lift our hands. We ought to give praise to God. We ought to open our mouth in praise and thanksgiving, and we ought to let the Holy Spirit begin to move and exercise in our lives right now. Come on, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome into my life. Welcome into this house. Welcome into your people. Oh, fill your people today. Fill your people to overflowing today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Ah, don't you sense his presence in this house right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your touch. Thank you for your witness, Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. I got to hurry. I got to hurry to tell you. If you want to have power for pressurized living, you need to identify the source. And you need the impartation of the Spirit. Then there's one final thing, and it's the most important component. The ultimate purpose. Hear me. The ultimate purpose of the Spirit's power is so that you can then impact the society. Jesus told the disciples they were to wait until they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But once they were filled, he didn't say they were supposed to sit around and rejoice in the blessing. They weren't supposed to form a Holy Spirit club to get together and exercise spiritual gifts over one another and shout praises together. The purpose of the Spirit's infilling is in the rest of verse 8. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Sure, sure, the Spirit helps you bear up under the pressure. But the primary purpose of the power of the Spirit is to give you an ability to get others connected in a right relationship with Jesus. Now, you have to remember, I was raised in this thing. 
I've been a participant in the fullness of the Spirit literally all my life. What I've observed is that sometimes people get so carried away by the manifestations of the Spirit and by the peripheral issues about the Spirit and by the demonstrations of power that accompany the entrance of the Spirit that they forget the purpose of the Spirit. All too often, signs and wonders and demonstrations of spiritual gifts become the focus and the object of Pentecostal worship rather than Jesus. And I want to tell you today, the Holy Spirit isn't given for your enjoyment. He's given for your employment. It's true that when the, when the power of the Holy Spirit is present, people are divinely healed. But I want to tell you, your spiritual enemy doesn't really care how many people you get healed as long as you focus on healing instead of Jesus. It's true that the Holy Spirit manifests himself in the supernatural gift of speaking in tongues. But your spiritual enemy doesn't care how loud or how long you speak in tongues as long as you focus on tongues instead of Jesus. Somewhere in the midst of all the miracle manifestations and all the charitable works of benevolence and all the development of personal potential, we must never forget that the mission of the church and the ministry of believers is to call people to Jesus. So you don't get people to Jesus by argument. You don't get people to Jesus by making them feel guilty. But it's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction. It's the Holy Spirit that draws people to Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals him in such an attractive way that they are compelled to follow him. I want to tell you, if the Jesus you're preaching isn't attractive, then it's probably not the right Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit working in your life in power that shows the benefits and the blessing and the beauty of following Jesus. The mark of being filled with the Spirit is power. Power for pressurized living. I'm talking about bondage-breaking power. I'm talking about disease-healing power. I'm talking about miracle-working power. I'm talking about yoke-destroying power. I'm talking about devil-chasing power. I'm talking about gospel-proclaiming power. It's a power that keeps you from falling. It's a power that keeps you from giving up. It's a power that keeps you from giving in. It's a power that keeps you holding on. It's a power that keeps you going one day at a time, one step at a time, just putting one foot in front of the other all the way until you finally step over into the eternal presence of the Lord. Now, without apology, without apology, this church is a church that believes in the Spirit-empowered life. It's a church that believes in the present dynamic power of the Spirit filling those who are surrendered to Jesus. It's a Pentecostal church. I want to tell you today what makes us Pentecostal isn't our lively music. It isn't because I preach loud and fast and start slinging sweat when I get all wound up. It isn't because some people fall down when we lay hands on them in prayer. It isn't because we speak in tongues. That's not what makes us Pentecostal. It isn't because the congregation gets emotionally charged and you you shout amen and hallelujah in the midst of the pastor's message. And it isn't because we sometimes change the order of the service because we sense the Lord moving in a different direction from what we had originally planned. That's not what makes us Pentecostal. Those things are wonderful, and I want to I want to tell you I embrace them with a grateful heart. But none of those are what make us Pentecostal. Instead, we are truly Pentecostal when we go into a lost world that is dying and going to hell without a Savior. And through the power of the Spirit, we snatch them from the kingdom of darkness and we bring them into the kingdom of God. That's what makes us Pentecostal. If you're going to have power for pressurized living, then you need to be filled with the Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit, then when you go into this world, you are the person to bring the kingdom life wherever you go. Everywhere you go, you bring light to dark places. You cast out demons that are tormenting the hearts and minds of the, and the emotions of the people in your sphere of influence. I want to tell you, when you go in, in the power of the Spirit, you, just your presence is going to make demons uncomfortable. Some of the problems some of you are having on your job, 
Is it because you're doing a bad job and it's not because the people you're working with are bad people? It's just because the spirit in you is stirring up the spirit in them. Because darkness can't stand in the presence of light. When you go, you, you break the bondage of addictions. You heal the torment of a past filled with guilt and remorse. You bind up the brokenhearted. You speak comfort and consolation to those who are hurting. You point people to the only source of real hope that is available in this world, and that is Jesus. Yes. Pastor Larry, come, come play me down. When you're filled with the Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus becomes your ministry. The prophet proclaimed his ministry in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Jesus then embraced that ministry in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Here's what he said when he read from the prophet. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's your ministry. And you do it by the power of the Spirit. In fact, that's the only way you can do it. The power you need to stand against the pressure of this age and the power you need to fulfill your calling and purpose as a follower of Jesus is the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand with me. I... Yes. You need, you need to be filled with the Spirit. Let me just tell you real quick how that happens. You ask, you believe, and you receive. I know that sounds simple. It, it is simple. It's not simplistic, but it is simple. See, he wants you to be filled even more than you want to be filled. So I want to pray for you. I don't know if it'll happen right now. It may, I, I, I believe it, it can and, and very well, very well might. Right in this moment, as you're yielded to the Holy Spirit, He will fill your life. It may not happen in this building, though. It, it, it may happen with somebody in your living room while you're watching online. It might happen in some of you when you get in your car and hit, start heading home. If that happens, you might want to pull over. I'm just saying. Start getting overwhelmed by the presence of God. You, you might want to pull over. Either that or just give your angels an extra tip while they're, you know, for working overtime. Some of you have been filled with the Spirit, but, but you sprung a leak. And it's all leaked out. You need to be refilled. Would you make that your prayer today? All over this house, let's just lift our hands. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus believing that the Holy Spirit is for each person who has surrendered their life to Jesus. And so now, I'm asking that you will fill these people with the Holy Spirit. Baptize them to overflowing. <laughs> fill them up to the, the full, oh Lord, with the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray for those who have experienced your fullness in the past, but but it feels like it's just kind of leaked out and they've gotten cold. Oh, Lord, rekindle the fire. Refill them, I pray, with the fullness of your spirit. Don't let one hungry heart go unsatisfied. I pray this in the name of Jesus. I want you to just all over this house, just, just in your own words, just say to the Lord, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Would you just say that? Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. And now I want you to just thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for your promise. I believe you're doing it. And now just yield to the Holy Spirit as he enters into your life right now.